Hi, I'm Annie Leonard with the story of Stuff. Welcome to another episode of The Good Stuff, where we talk with people who are working on solutions to the take-make-waste system that's trashing the planet, threatening our communities, and harming our health. If you're of a certain age, mine, you'll remember the crying Indian ad. A Native American, actually an Italian actor, paddles a canoe through a trash-strewn river. As he walks along the shore, a bag of trash is thrown out the window of a passing car. A tear rolls down his cheek as the narrator intones, people start pollution. People can stop it. The ad had a huge impact on a generation awakening to the environmental crisis. We watched it over and over and vowed to make changes in our individual lives to stop pollution. That was exactly what the ad's creators wanted, for it was produced by the garbage makers themselves. It was an ingenious and insidious effort by the producers of disposable packaging and products who work hard to convince us that it's our fault that their toxic throwaway junk litters our landscapes, fouls our water, and kills fish and wildlife. And it's our responsibility to stop it, as though the companies that make all this junk have nothing to do with it. It's a lie that has served plastic makers all too well. But there's a new plastic threat that can't be blamed on slobs throwing plastic in the river rather than the recycling bin. Now there's evidence that some plastics are actually designed to be washed right down the drain into our waters. Today on The Good Stuff, we'll talk to the guy who made this shocking discovery. We'll make a satellite phone call to the high seas, where he and a crew are on a voyage to track down more evidence of plastics devastation in our oceans. But it's not all bad news. We'll also learn about the remarkable success he's having solving the problem and how you can help. So let's go. Steve Wilson works for a fantastic organization called Five Gyres, which sails to remote parts of the ocean to document plastic debris circulating in the ocean currents, or gyres. Sea life can mistake plastic bags for jellyfish and eat or get strangled by them. Marine mammals may die of starvation with stomachs full of plastic. Of course, what gets into sea creatures can also end up on our dinner plates and in our own bodies. Wilson wondered if plastic debris is accumulating in inland waters, so he went trawling in the Great Lakes. To his surprise, the samples he collected had hundreds of thousands of tiny plastic beads, where did they come from? Eventually, he found the source, our bathroom showers. But let's let him tell the story. Stiv, welcome to The Good Stuff. Hi. Great to be here, Annie. Thanks for having me. Um, so, Stiv, you you were trained as a journalist. That's your background, right? Yeah, I was a chef too, but uh, moved from fiction writing into journalism. Started finding other people's stories more interesting than my own, I guess. So from being a chef and a journalist to devoting your life to fighting plastic, how did that happen? Yeah, I, I guess I'm sort of a late bloomer, but uh, when I was 30, I'm now 41, started surfing in Oregon. There's places in Oregon where you surf where you can't see a human-made object at all. It's just old growth forest. And I was surfing on one particular day and I came in, my dog was on the beach, and there was just this incredible amount of plastic. And you could tell that it was degraded, that it had been in the ocean for a while and it had piled up. And the math part of my brain just sort of looked at it and realized, you know, the ocean is really big and this stuff has got to be everywhere. As a journalist, I started researching it and reaching out to people who were involved in the movement and getting involved with the Surfrider Foundation, I said, let's, you know, let's do something about this. Let's uh, work on plastic bag policy in Portland. And that's what we did for four years, worked on it. And I learned sort of the skills or tools of, of an activist and just slowly broadened my horizons from city to state to country to global. A couple words there I want you to elaborate on. Garbage patch and five gyres. What is a gyre? So a gyre, a gyre is a is a totally natural phenomenon. And and how it is formed is you have two opposing trade winds from blowing from west to east and then east to west at a higher and lower latitude, which creates a swirling vortex. 
So the best way to think of it is sort of when you're watching water go down a drain in a bathtub, just imagine there is no drain. And it's the same sort of swirl. And there's five major ones in the world's oceans, North, South Atlantic, North, South Pacific, and the Indian Ocean. Okay, so then what's, what does the garbage have to do with this? So this is where all the world's garbage collects. Its contributions come from every watershed, every river, every estuary in the world. And when this stuff goes out into the ocean, it either washes up on another shore or gets caught in these swirling vortexes. And as you get to the center of it, it gets denser and denser. So the plastic bags we see floating in the wind or the styrofoam floating down some river, this is where it eventually ends up? Yeah, exactly. It's important to remember that about half the plastic that is made actually sinks. So we have no idea how much is on the ocean floor and very, very little studies about that. The other half floats. So Five Gyres, the organization you work with, goes out to check out these gyres. How do you, how do you investigate them? What does Five Gyres do? And so what we literally do is skim the surface of the ocean about every 50 miles as we sail across it. And you've done this all over the world. Yes, we've taken samples in every major ocean, uh, the Great Lakes as well, uh, the Bay of Bengal, and up where this summer we'll be going to the Viking Gyre, which is just south of Iceland. You once told me a story about standing on one of these five gyre boats and looking out onto a bed of seagrass and seeing all the plastic on it. And you were about to, you were a journalist then on the ship as a journalist. So it's funny how I I got on that boat is, you know, I had organized an event for our bag ban uh, kickoff in Portland. And I found out about this research trip in the North Atlantic. And I said to the organizers, I said, how do I get on this boat? I grew up sailing. It's always been my dream to sail across an ocean. And I wanted to report on it from a firsthand authentic vantage because there's a lot of misnomers about uh, what this looks like and how it manifests in the ocean. So I got on board and I was writing a story and we came into a particularly big patch of debris that was sort of aggregated by this natural seagrass that occurs in the North Atlantic called sargassum. And we came across this patch that probably had, I don't even know, I'm just guessing, 10,000 pieces of plastic in various sizes. And I was watching a scoop uh, a couple of our crew members scoop some of this stuff out with, with you know, fishing nets, with landing nets. And I was taking photos of it. And it was just this moment that I was two and a half weeks of, from land, the farthest I've ever been from anything ever. And just the math of that and seeing, you know, this human stain out in the middle of this view, <laughs> this big, beautiful wilderness – I just said, that's it. I am going to work on this full time. And I literally via satellite emailed my the magazine I was working for and resigned. So when you see all this garbage, isn't it possible to just scoop all the plastic out and bring it home and recycle it? No. The sort of idea that we're going to design some sort of crazy contraption that could go out into the middle of the ocean and skim the surface, well, that poses a lot of problems. One, the ocean is – really, 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 really big. It's 70% of the Earth's surface. Plastic is everywhere. It's not just in the gyres. It's just concentrated by the gyres. And it's confetti-like. It's broken down into these small pieces. You have animals living on it. You have plankton around it. So the bycatch of taking a net and pulling this out of the ocean is 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 going to be incredible. And And, you know, people – don't necessarily fight for plankton. Be, I, we call it uncharismatic microfauna um, is the technical term. But, uh, you know, this is the basis of the food chain in, in the ocean. If you start removing large amounts of plankton, you are going to, uh, you know, create dead zones in the ocean. And it's also just – it's incomprehensibly big. You know, you're talking about it, – it's akin to – taking a, a vacuum cleaner and sticking it up in the middle of downtown L.A. and and and, and believing that you're going to pull all the smog out of the air. And what's the environmental impact of all this plastic? How does it affect sea life? So the really scary thing about these microplastics in the ocean is 
there's a lot of evidence that sort of the base food chain uh, fish eat these things. Plastic, because it is made out of a fat or oil, is it attracts all the pollutants that come off of land. So this is oil from your car. This is pesticides. This is flame retardants. All that stuff runs downhill to the ocean. Plastic attracts these things, and they these toxins are repelled by water. So plastic is actually a sponge for pollutants. And a single piece of plastic the size of your thumbnail in the middle of the ocean can have up to a million times higher toxicity than the water around it. So when you have little fish eating pollutant-laden plastic and big fish eating littler fish, ultimately we get to the top of that food chain and it's us. So when the toxic-laden plastics are eaten by small fish, those chemicals transfer to the fish tissue. And what happens then is they become hormone disruptors. Uh, they can make boys more like girls, girls more like boys, also causes liver damage in the animal, which we all know the liver is, is what processes toxins in our bodies and allows us to function. So these plastics contaminate fish and could even contaminate us. I've also heard stories about um, strangulation, about birds and dolphins and turtles eating plastic and then dying of starvation because their stomachs are full of plastic, which actually provide no nutrients. Can you tell us a little about that? Yeah, that's the other really uh, disheartening thing is it takes a while for these plastics, once they enter the marine environment, to, to, to break down into small pieces. So – what what that means is that you have big chunks of plastic floating across the ocean and you have derelict fishing gear and you have six-pack rings and animals are curious. They check this stuff out and often when they check it out, they, you know, they meet their doom because they'll end up being strangled by this or entangled. Big animals will eat big chunks of plastic too. I mean, you find evidence of all sea turtle species eating plastic. Whales, dolphins, uh, sharks, uh, you name it, anything. It's ubiquitous out there. Plastic is as common in the ocean as, as, as wood or seaweed. Or it's, it's not just in the ecosystem. It's a dominant feature of the ecosystem. And that's really scary. So first you were working on plastic in the ocean. And now you've been working on plastic in the Great Lakes. How did you make that transition? I grew up on the Great Lakes, and this was the ocean to me. One of the biggest problems with the ocean garbage patches is it's not in anybody's backyard. Well, the Great Lakes are a huge source of pride for the middle of North America, both on the Canadian side and the American side. It represents everything that's good. It's your weekend fishing trip. It's, you know, sitting on a beach. And I felt that, you know, it would be interesting to look at these lakes and if we found stuff, I think we would get, you know, the middle of America to, to realize that this is a homegrown problem, not one that just exists in the middle of the ocean where nobody's been. You know, as a small organization, you know, we don't have a huge research budget. So we, we, we literally hitched a ride on a replica of a War of 1812 tall ship uh, naval brig called the Niagara. It, it was amazing that the crew was so cooperative. I mean, because it takes 40 minutes to turn this thing around. And I would say to the captain, I say, hey, I'd like to sample back there. And pretty soon sails were being dropped and raised and people are climbing, rigging and screaming. And all of a sudden, yeah, we were able to sample. What did you find? We found a lot of different kinds of plastic. You know, we found some of the normal microplastics. And when I say normal, I've been doing this too long. Uh, <laughs> we found some of the typical microplastics that you find in the ocean. But we also found monofilament line, and that's just fishing line. You know, when you cut when you cut the the line, if you you know you get snag or something. We also found acrylics that are coming off of you know boat paint, that sort of thing. And then the thing we found the most of was something we didn't recognize and something we didn't anticipate. And it was this really, really, really small sort of powdery plastic. And once we – in really high concentrations. And when we started looking at it under a microscope, 
we recognized that this was coming from uh, personal care products, things that you use to wash your face, to to exfoliate your face. These microbeads are in hundreds and hundreds of products, and there's 330,000 of them per product, and they're designed to go down the drain. Washing your face with a product that contains microbeads is no different than littering plastic on the ground or in a river. So how do we know if our facial wash or our body scrub has these plastic microbeads in it? Luckily, in the United States, uh, producers are required to, uh, to, to say what the ingredients of the products are. So, you know, when you're in the shopping, uh, you know, the shopping market and you're looking for a face wash or something, you turn it around, look at the back. And if you see polyethylene or polypropylene, you know it has microbeads. And often, you know, it's funny is this is actually a source of pride. So even on the front of the product, it'll say thousands of scrubbing microbeads or they'll have some sort of variation of that. There are some products out there with natural alternatives like apricot shells or jojoba beans that are just ground down. And those are fine. You know, that's organic material. It will decompose naturally in any environment. Uh, but the plastic, you know, was added about a decade ago, and it's the most common in these products now. So since you found out about these microbeads, you have since been on a crusade that has been more successful than just about any environmental campaign I have seen. Can you talk a little bit about your work to get companies to stop using it and then to get an even more solid solution is to get laws banning it? Yeah, so once we determined that these microbeads were coming from personal care products, we started talking to these companies. We got rebuffed uh, by Procter & Gamble at first. We were able to get a call with them and they said, you know, this is not a problem. You know, we have 725 PhDs on staff. We're aware of this, et cetera. So we were rebuffed and I wasn't satisfied with that, nor was our team. And we started a letter writing campaign to Procter & Gamble well, where we basically probably destroyed their company email for four or five days by sending over 15,000 letters from our community and other uh, other folks who were, were interested in the cause. Story of Stuff helped us with this as well. Uh, we did social media bombing. We're posting on Facebook and through Twitter. And we made it very simple. We said, get, plas get plastic off my face and out of my water. You know, made it really simple for people to understand. Uh, with Johnson & Johnson, just the threat of the campaign against them got them to agree to publicly phase out within 72 hours. And after about a week, uh, speaking of Procter & Gamble, going back to Procter & Gamble, after a week of probably which was just an email nightmare at the company for a while. They sent one email to us that said, we will phase these beads out. And this started happening just as sort of a domino effect with a few of these companies because, you know, one thing I've determined in this campaign, regardless of all the environmental implications, people just don't like brushing their teeth or washing their face with plastic beads. They think it's creepy. They think it's wrong. It was great that we got success with some of the big guys, but you know, I didn't have the patience or the time to go after two, three hundred different companies and try and get them to voluntarily phase this out. By taking a legislative approach, we could get a firm deadline for phase out uh, industry wide. So there's now five states that have bills pending or in process? Yeah. So Minnesota, Ohio, Illinois, New York, and California. And for some reason, you know, I. I'm surprised by our success, you know, frankly, it's it's sort of unheard of to get five bills introduced in five states. And I have legislators calling me from all sorts of other states wanting to introduce this in uh, the 2015 legislative season. So yeah, they're all moving and I'm crossing my fingers, but I think we're going to win. Steve, thank you so much for the work that you do. You give me hope and inspire me and I want to go home and wash my face with some apricot kernels. Same with you, Annie. Thanks for having me here. <laughs>
Five Gyres is currently on a voyage to Iceland to study plastics pollution in the North Atlantic. Allison Cook, Director of Community Engagement for the Story of Stuff Project, signed on as part of the ship's crew. In early June, we called Allison via satellite phone for a first-hand report from the ship. So, Allison Cook, it is great to be talking to you. Where are you? Well, we just left from Bermuda yesterday, and we are heading towards Iceland. So we're in the middle of the North Atlantic. We've got people from England and people from Guatemala, um, and it's just a really great crew with a great attitude. Um, I definitely won the Seasickness Award yesterday. And we actually have two trawls going right now. We have a high-speed trawl that's kind of taking surface plastic as we're going through um, the oceans, and then we also have a... Uh, a vertical trawl that's taking examples of plastics from throughout the different layers of the ocean. So you're out in the middle of the sea and can see nothing but glassy waters, you said. Are you finding plastic out there? We certainly are. We've already picked up, we've, we've collected a number of samples of microplastics. So we have these kind of small tube-like things with, fit, with netting at the end that allow us to pick up pieces of plastic. We've also hauled in several large pieces of styrofoam that have been floating alongside the boat. We also just saw an amazing pot of dolphins. And I think I'm just surprised by just how much plastic there is. I mean, there's nothing around us. Um, when we see, you know, it, it's, a, it's something to comment on when you see a bird or another ship. <laughs> you can't see anything. And, and even at this distance, there's just an impressive amount of plastic. In fact, the oceans were so glassy this morning um, that you could just kind of see the microplastic floating on top. We didn't even need to trawl. We were just counting it sitting at the, um, the bow of the boat. One of the things that's so nice about being here, and even as difficult as it, it is for me transitioning right now, um, is just being surrounded with so many people who care so passionately about this issue. We have um, several marine biologists, um, people who work in coastal management, um, you know, people who, are, we have an actress from LA um, and a guy who does adventure, um, advent, like basically outdoor adventure uh, pieces in Guatemala. And what's really clear is that everyone is, it, it kind of cares deeply about the planet and the oceans and fighting plastic and, and really kind of is willing to put themselves into the middle of this kind of wild ocean on this crazy expedition. Well, Allison, one thing to remember is that luckily seasickness doesn't last as long as plastic. <laughs> Thank you, Annie. More than 40 years after the Crying Indian ad, the Pro Plastics PR guys are still at it. At a recent event in San Francisco, I heard a guy from the American Chemistry Council, a lobby group that fights regulation of chemical products, propose a simple solution to plastic pollution of the oceans. Just put more recycling bins on the beaches. Give me a break. Kudos to the companies who've already agreed to get rid of plastic microbeads. But let's not hold our breath waiting for the entire plastics industry to do the right thing. As responsible citizens, our role is to tell regulators and lawmakers we need to get microbeads out of our personal care products, off our drugstore shelves, gone from the market, banned. Sure, as ethical consumers, we should also avoid products with plastic microbeads and give the companies who use them a piece of our mind. Let's email, call, or tweet them to let them know we won't be buying their products anymore. But we can't stop there. If we leave it up to the industry alone, their response is likely to be as authentic a solution as a phony crying Indian. So that's it for this episode of The Good Stuff. And for a while at least, we'll be taking a break from producing any more episodes. I've got an exciting new job at Greenpeace, where I started out more than 20 years ago. I'll still be involved with the Story of Stuff project because its work is too important to leave behind. We're going to keep working to change the take-make-waste economy and to build our incredible community of change makers. We've had some great conversations here over the past couple of years. I've really enjoyed sharing them with you. Thanks, as always, to Youth Radio in Oakland, California, for the use of their studios and to our engineer, James Rollins. The Good Stuff was produced by Bill Walker. So until we meet again... Keep sharing the good stuff.
That's it for this episode of The Good Stuff. Our show comes to you from the studios of Youth Radio in Oakland, California. Our engineer is James Rowland. The Good Stuff is produced by Bill Walker. We'll have another show online in a few weeks. If you like this podcast, please share it with your friends. Find us on Facebook and storyofstuff.org and keep working on the good stuff in your own community. Thanks for being part of the solution. Thank you.